I'm ready. You ready? Um, thanks for coming. So, so really great to see so many of you at the end of the day. I'm sure you're as tired as I am. Um, beer is coming. <laughs> Don't worry. I won't. <laughs> I won't keep you from your beer. Um, so I gave a talk at Spring I/O last year in in this room, I think. Um, which was about Spring Cloud Function and the topic came up when I was working on Spring Cloud Function about um, cold start time for the JVM. The Java processes just tend to take a little bit of time to get started. Once they're started, of course, the, J the JVM is an awesome place <laughs> to run you know, fast, efficient, um, code, but startup has always been a little bit of a, um, an obsession of mine. So part of that talk I gave last year was um, sort of the beginning of some of the research that I've been doing over the last year or so. So this is kind of a status update talk. It's kind of, here's where we are. Um, and I think you'll see we've done quite a lot of work actually um, in the last 12 months on this topic. So. Um, you know, the, 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 um, the JVM is a complicated, a complicated piece of uh, machinery. Um, I don't understand it. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to even start trying to understand it, but I have tried to measure it. Okay. So that's kind of where I am at the minute. And that's where I am in my journey. Maybe one day. I'll actually uh, <laughs> be able to contribute something else. Um, but um, there's sort of a, a, an impedance mismatch between people who work on the JVM and people who work on apps like us, right? And Spring developers. We don't actually share the same concerns. What they do is awesome, but they don't know how to build apps. And what we do is equally awesome in a different way that we don't understand how the JVM works and somehow we've got to meet in the middle. Um, so hopefully, you know, this will contribute something uh, towards that effort, if nothing else. And it's certainly been um, quite an important piece of, um, there has been a lot of important work done, not by me, <laughs> in the spring team um, this year. and. Uh, I hope that some of it was influenced by me, by what I've been doing here. Um, so I'd like to sort of take you through the journey a little bit, show you um, uh, what I've been measuring. I've been doing a lot of work on JVM startup time, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other performance and resource issues that we can study. There are other people actually in the uh, Spring Engineering team doing run more runtime benchmarks and things like that. Um, those are also valuable. I just don't have time to talk about everything today. So I'm going to talk about my startup time work. Um, so I'm going to talk, because that's, you know, it's a pain point, right? Every, um, who's got an integration test suite that's a little bit slow? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, it would be good to know why, at least, wouldn't it, even if we can't improve it. But it turns out we can improve it. So um, stay tuned. Um, so I'm going to talk about, you know, what if you've got that nasty integration test suite that you wish was running faster, what is it that's happening? Why, why is it slow? What is it that, can you, can you actually blame Spring for any of that? Well, you can blame it, some of, some of it I'm sure you can, but not as much as you might sometimes think, you know, when you're tearing your hair out and you want to throw your computer out of the window. It's probably not Spring that is fundamentally responsible <laughs> for the problem that you're experiencing. Um, and I think now that I can, you know, stand here and claim that we've measured it and we've done the best that we can to um, improve every bit that we could. So I'll talk about some of the tools that I used um, doing this measurement exercise. Um, I'll talk about various options that you've got for improving your life if you have this slow startup problem. Um, and some of them, every time I give this talk, I'm happy to say, um, I have to cross one off the list because every time I measure something identifiable, 
does somebody clever in the Spring Framework or Spring Boot team fixes something? And then <laughs> I don't have to talk about it anymore. Um, but I'll, I'll mention a few of those as we go along because they're not all in production yet, so they're, they're new things. They're probably worth knowing about. So I'll talk about how to speed up startup time, and startup time is uh, very correlated with the integration test suite. Um, and I'll talk about ongoing work, what we're still doing, um, and what we might see in the future. So uh, just a couple of pictures to start off. This is now quite an old one. Um, more than six months old, I should think. But it still tells uh, a, a decent story. Um, so it's different sample apps. Uh, they're all the same feature set. They're all Spring Boot, Netty, <coughs> a single HTTP endpoint. So it's like a hello world, but with you know a full HTTP stack. And um, these are start startup times from my lap measured on my laptop, which isn't you know particularly powerful or. Um, uh, fast or anything. So when I started these measurements, we had an app that could start in 1300 milliseconds. I think that was with Spring Boot 2.0. And we tweaked things a bit and we got to um, Spring Boot 2.1. We were starting to see improvements. So that's like down from 1300 to less than 1200 milliseconds. I could tell you the difference is, the difference I w I will become clear actually when I show another picture, so I'll talk more about that later. Um, and then I started playing around with um, a new feature at the time, um, well from Spring Boot 2 anyway, and Spring Framework 5, which is functional bean definitions, and I'll explain more about that. There's a Spring Tips video on it if you want to learn a bit more from Josh. Um, and I was able to run the same app in um, basically half the time, so that looked promising. And I looked, a bit, looked into that a bit more. There are two versions of that. One of them uses Spring Boot, that's Bunk. I'll refer to Bunk later. And one of them doesn't use Spring Boot. So if you take out, at the time, this, this gap is now um, almost closed off, actually, because the uh, Spring Boot overhead, we looked into that and researched it a lot. Um, the difference between Spring Boot and not Spring Boot there is about, I don't know, 50 milliseconds or something, it's not, not really that much. Um, but the reason that I like to show this slide is this one. So this is um, startup time for the same application when the class loader is already warm, the JVM is already warm. So I've started the app and I've closed the application context and then started it again. Close, just run, close, run, close, run like that. And then it's not it's dramatic, right? Then this is properly a factor of 10 faster. So that tells me something, right? <laughs> that tells me something about just the fundamental nature of the way that the JVM currently, as it's designed, they all work like this, class loading, all right? That's like 80, 90% of the time on startup is class loading. And if you take one message away from this talk, that's it, class loading. What do you get for when you load a class? You get a feature. So if your app has features, you have to load classes, it takes a little bit longer. When it's cold, okay, when it's warm, it doesn't. So um, has anybody ever used DevTools, Spring Boot DevTools? Enough people to know what it means. I'll show, you, I'll show you what it means. Well, that's basically what we do here, right? DevTools is a, a warm JVM just restarting an application context. We throw away the class loader, build a new one that's actually the same, exactly the same um, experiment I did there. So, um, some interesting observations. This graph um, sort of moves slightly off the topic of startup time, but it's still there. Um, so this is actually showing you why Spring Boot 2.1 and 2.2 are so much better. Um, so on the y-axis, I've got startup time. It's the same app. Um, the blue is the blue from the, the first um, slide, so that's the 1300 milliseconds. And then what I do is I squeeze the max heap size, minus x, mx, right? 100 megs, 50 megs, 10 megs. I, and I squeeze it until the point where you get this hockey stick. 
and that's basically beyond that the app can't start garbage collection wins and you get an out of memory error on startup it's quite especially with older versions of spring boot it's quite a characteristic and quite a steep curve um, and okay this, so then um, the red one is spring boot 2.1 so that's where we were in sort of October last year that's amazing right that's a really big difference so we went down from uh, running a, an app with netty in like 25 megabytes of heap down to 10 or even less and now in spring boot 2.2 they've pushed it even even a little bit further so you can happily run it in 10 megs you can go down to eight six maybe even you know six six megabytes of heap you can still run it it's not going to be happy but you can still run it um, and the lines at the bottom, those are um, bunk, so the, the boot application with functional bean definitions. And that's even more impressive, right? So I can drive that right down. It doesn't really have that hockey stick even. There's a, there's a, there's a, it's de I can't detect it because I can't see the, the difference between running and not running. There's no gradual um, change between the two. Suddenly it just stops running. So that's um, with 2.1, Spring Boot 2.1, Spring Boot 2.2. And the reason this is informative is because um, while the class loading that I just explained has to still happen, you know, you're never going to get away from that. If you've got a cold JVM, you need to start the classes, start the application, you need to load its classes. There are things we can do in the framework, optimizations we can make to stop garbage collection from needing to happen as much and that has actually been a quite a dramatic improvement in um, Spring Boot 2.1 and 2.2 and that's a different way of telling that story so um, I haven't got a 2.2 picture but it's basically the same as 2.1 this is uh, these are flame graphs um, generated by a tool called async profiler which is really neat has any, anybody used async profiler before it's great. You can attach it to a running Java process and it hardly affects the runtime performance, but you get nice, pretty flame graphs out of it, like for free. So who wouldn't? And they're nice. You can click on them and zoom in and you can do searches on the text in the... Anyway, so um, each flame is a method call, essentially, and the stack above it is nested method calls. So this method calls that one, calls that one, calls that one, calls that one. And the width of the flame is, is the number of samples in the profiler. So it's roughly proportional to the time spent doing <coughs> this, doing whatever it was doing. And these are at startup. So there's just the first like, you know, um, second of an application's life. And the imp important thing is they're actually very similar looking, apart from this angry little red and yellow blob over here. And what that is, is um, red and yellow means it doesn't mean angry actually it means not in user memory so this is the gar this is the JVM doing garbage collection and you can see in Spring Boot 2.1 2.2 we just squeeze that and the more you squeeze that the further to the right that hockey stick goes that's what we did um, and a lot a lot of that is um, it's through avoiding usage of APIs that are in the JDK, in fact. So the JDK has a lot of useful stuff in it, right? But um, they also have to be very cautious sometimes and they have to make, you know, you make a, a method call to, um, let's say, class.getDeclaredMethods. That one um, lists all of the, uh, the methods in a class makes a copy of it for you. And that's where the garbage comes from. So there's a copy. Every time you call class.getDeclaredMethods, you get an extra copy and garbage builds up. So if you can avoid doing that, which we found several ways to do in the Spring Boot 2.1, 2.2, if you can avoid doing that, you can avoid the garbage collection hit. So that's what's, um, that's what's happening there. So um, often the best way to see this is uh, with a nice demo. <coughs> So what I'll do is, um, I could do Hello World, like the apps that I was just showing, but I thought it would be nice to show a sort of real application. Now, um, this is the pet clinic. 
Who's seen the pet clinic? Everyone's seen the pet clinic. Um, <laughs> so it's sort of a real application, right? It's a Spring Boot, J J Spring Data JPA app. It has like three entities or something like that. And it has time leaf, it has a UI and a database. Um, and this is, okay, so this is Pet Clinic from Master, Spring Projects Master. Um, I'm going to actually make it worse by downgrading Spring Boot to 2.0, just so you can see how dramatic the change is. Um, so I'll just make Maven rebuild that so it's happy. And then I'm gonna go into my Pet Clinic application. Here's the application, just standard Spring Boot stuff, very small amount of code, run as Java application and I've already got launches set up for this in the IDE, so it's given me a choice. So this is my crappy laptop. This is my experience launching Spring Boot Pet Clinic. Nine, 8.7 seconds. I was going to say nine, but 8.7. Um, feels about right, yeah? I mean, we're used to that kind of crap. Um, but so let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to change this to 2.2, whoops. Um, you only live once, don't you? So I might as well do snapshots, build minus snapshot. Does that look right? Um, just do the same little Maven dance as before. Um, I'm also going to so as I go through um, the presentation, I'll explain some of the things I'm doing now. I'm going to exclude a couple of things from the class path. So Pet Clinic doesn't use JSON. There's no need, no need for it to be there at all. And I'm going to change the logging implementation from the default. So the logging is by default in the Spring Boot. Log back, and I'm going to just switch that around. So I'm going to exclude those two things. And then I'm going to go into the dependencies. <laughs> so everybody following what I'm doing here, I'm going to insert uh, SLF4J, the JDK, just the fastest logger there is. It isn't the nicest, it is, it's a horrible logger, JDK logging, but it's faster. So um, not much, but you know, a bit. So it'll make a difference. And then I'm just going to run this app again. Okay, so now we're ready. We're going to go run as Java application. This time I'm going to choose the one called flags because I put some command line flags on the JVM and I'll show you what those are in a minute. Ready? Hold your nose. There we go. Less than three seconds. I reckon if I did it a few times, you'd probably see 2.7, 2.8. That's all right, isn't it? <laughs> I was pleased. <laughs> that wasn't me that did that, right? I mean, I, all I did was just mention to people a few times that <laughs> there was, you could make it faster, you could make it faster. And they did it. Um, yeah, so um, uh, the, the flags will come up on the slides in a minute. So what did I do? Um, and how much of those, which of those things had the biggest impact? Well, Spring, Spring Boot 2.2 had a big impact. Um, but there are some features in Spring Boot 2.2 as well that I switched on there that we can have a look at. Um, so how did I make it go faster? I did some class path exclusions. I'll talk about the details later. I didn't use the Spring Context, context Indexer. Does anybody ever try that? I was talking to Bedran today and he did, so I know, <laughs> I know some people use it. Um, it's an application, uh, it's a, an annotation processor. It's been in Spring since I think four point something, spring 4.2 maybe. Um, you just put it on the class path and it generates an index of the components. You know, when you do at component scan and it looks in all the packages in your application for at component annotations, it just makes an index of that so it doesn't have to do it again. Now, it turns out that <laughs> spring was never doing very much work there. People used to say component scanning is expensive, component scanning is expensive, so we put this in there and prove to them it wasn't, but <laughs> um, it's a little bit faster. The more beans you've got, the, the, the more impact you get. With Pet Clinic, I don't know, there might be 
a dozen beans tops, um, component scan beans, and you might you could measure the difference. Like it would be you know ten milliseconds or something. <coughs> if you want the ten milliseconds, use it. Or if you've got an app with ten thousand beans, definitely worth it. Um, I used to say. Uh, and it broke my heart to say that, don't use the actuators if you can afford not to, because it was, if you start using actuators in Spring Boot 2.0, it's going to be, you know, more than half a second, maybe even a second, uh, you know, seven, eight hundred milliseconds. So if you can afford not to, then, you know, you get that back. Um, however, when, you know, we looked at that in more detail, uh, the Spring Boot team decided to make some changes and since, actually since Spring Boot 2.0, most of the web endpoints were not enabled by default anyway. There's no point actually creating all of those beans, so they just switched them off and, unless they're enabled and then every, that problem went away. So I didn't do that with the, the pet clinic just now. If I had, I might have squeezed another you know, couple of maybe 20 milliseconds or something, but it's much better than it was in Spring Boot 2.2. Um, so use Spring Boot 2.2, <laughs> and it's not GA yet, GA yet, I know, so if you can't do that, use 2.1, it's still better. Um, this one, I think they also put a lot of effort into improving, so it still helps, um, but not much. Okay, so you might get another, you know, few tens of milliseconds out of this. Spring.config.location is where your application.properties file is. And if you know where it is, you can tell Spring Boot where to, go, where to go and look, and it doesn't have to go searching for it, because it will. It'll search for you know, um, application.properties, application.yaml, it'll look in the class path, it'll look in the file system, it'll look in subdirectories. It'll, so if you can stop it from doing that, it saves it a bit of time. Um, I also used to say switch off JMX if you're not using it, because it's enabled by default, and it does cost something, right? The uh, MX bean, the, um, the MB manager thing takes some time to start up in the JDK. They made that the default in the Spring Boot 2.2, so you have to enable it by default now. So I, don't, I no longer have to advise that, but if you, now if, you, if you're looking for where those, J, where those J, JMX endpoints are, then you need to switch them on, back on again. Um, another thing that happened in Spring Boot 2.2 was lazy bean definitions. So this has been a feature of Spring, Spring the framework since I think maybe Spring 2. Does anybody know if it's before that, lazy bean definitions? So in the XML you used to have a, a flag lazy equals true on the XML. Um, and it wasn't really used very much. Um, it, there wasn't much point because especially in the old days when you had that XML file, you know, X depends on Y and Y depends on Z, everything depends on something. So even if they're all lazy, as soon as you create one of them, the whole object graph has to be created. So there wasn't much point. Um, but one thing I noticed doing this work was that with Spring Boot, auto configuration, it's all you can eat, right? It's like you put something on the class path, you're going to get a bean. You put, you know, rest templates on the class path, you're going to get a rest template. Actually, it's not a rest template, it's a rest template builder, but you know what I mean. Um, and if you didn't use it, that was a waste, right? When nobody had to load that class. Um, class loading is expensive. Nobody had to create that, you know, instance. Um, so we looked at that and we decided that it was an interesting thing to do just to set all bean definitions to lazy and see what happened. And what happened was, I think in the pet clinic that was probably um, ooh, probably a good second, maybe a bit more, one point, one point something seconds, you know, had more than a thousand milliseconds from lazy bean definitions. Just stuff that, you know, may eventually be used. Let's say, you know, the health endpoint, the health endpoint is there. If you ever need it, you'll be able to ping it and it will then get created lazily. Um, now, the Spring Boot team, very sensibly, they, I think Andy wrote a blog about this, he pointed out when they announced this feature, that it might not be something you want to do in production, because in production, you'd rather fail on startup if there's going to be a problem, right? Um, you'd might, I'd, I'd rather do that anyway. So, so we left the default as not lazy, but 
at development time, right, when you're making a change, testing it, make a change, test it, make a change, test it, well, all you want then is just as fast as possible. And when you're writing those integration tests, if you're only using a small number of, you know, small slice of the application, why do you need to bother loading all of the other beans and that? So that's uh, definitely a good thing to do in, in a development time. Um, another thing that has been improved, but not to the extent that I can cross this off, um, the, the fat jar, the fat, the Spring Boot fat jars are brilliant, right? They're an excellent way to take binary code that's executable anywhere and just give it to somebody and say, here's a jar file, run it. But if you do Java minus jar, it's a bit slower than if you unpack it and then do Java minus CP, create the class path and you know specify the main, the main class. It's a bit slower because of the indirection, right? You, the jar, Java minus jar has to go into the jar to find the jars. And so there's just, you know, the, the jar loading thing is a little bit inefficient. Um, one, there's one change that they made in Spring Boot 2.2 which improves this, which is which will affect you if you're using, for instance, Cloud Foundry, because on Cloud Foundry, what they have, they have unpacked the jar for you already, but they weren't, you, they aren't using the main method from your cloud, from your application. They're using the Spring Boot jar launcher. Um, so that in that scenario, we now don't have, we don't go jar jar. We go straight to the file system. So. Um, that was an improvement actually in Spring Boot 2.2. So it's, the unpacked jar is always faster. Um, it's a little bit faster still if you use the, the application's own main class, not the Spring Boot one. Um, okay, um, here's one where I, I get dinged all the time. If there are any JVM experts in the audience, they always come up to me afterwards and say, don't do that. Um, but I still do it, right? <laughs> because, well, you know, you saw what happened with the pet clinic, right? So um, if you run the, the JVM with some extra flags, minus no verify is a really good one. That will take, um, that's not just, uh, a f you know, a, a, a few microseconds. That's like 30% of any app. It will be 30%, 40% faster if you just minus no verify. What does it mean? It means that the JVM is allowed to just load the class data and read the bytes, read the bytecode without checking that it's valid bytecode. So, you know, maybe you don't want to do it in production. That's fine if it's your choice. But, you know, I'm going to do that on my IDE, on my laptop. I just downloaded the jar file. I know where it came from. I know the bytes are good. You don't need to tell me that the bytes are good. Just do it quickly, all right. Um, so that that's one that you you could you could condition you could you know if you're running in a container and you built the jar if you built the container you know what's in it you can verify everything sort of ahead of time. That's I don't think that's such a bad choice, frankly. But the worst thing that happens really is that you know if you have a bad some bad bytecode, um, like an agent produces some bad bytecode that wasn't in your control, um, the JVM will crash. You know, it'll, the, the, the process will just disappear and you'll get no information about why it happened. Um, so if you're prepared to <laughs> face that kind of outcome, then you can do it, play that game. Um, the other one is to do with the compiler, the JIT compiler. So um, in the JVM, when it's running, it optimizes, heavily optimizes, right? It takes the bytecode, turns it into machine code and you can control how much work it does with that, with various command line options. This one says, um, I don't know the details, but stop at some level, right? Don't go the full hog. And that has a, a big effect on startup. That means that it doesn't have to do a lot of analysis of the code paths that it's running on startup. It's about an, another percentage thing. It's about another 10%. So those two things together, uh, between 30 and 50 percent improvement for pretty much any app. So I could have just done that with Spring Boot 2.0 and you would have seen a big improvement actually. Um, that would have gone down from nine seconds down to, you know, five and a half or something. But the other two and a half seconds, <laughs> that was all that other stuff. All right, that was all that other stuff. And um, at the bottom of the uh, slide is stuff that I didn't do yet. Um, so, auto configuration, 
I'll come, I'll come back to that, um, is all you can eat, right? At enable auto configuration is a nice Spring Boot application. I like using it. It you know, takes, takes the burden away. I don't have to think about what's happening. But you know, for some people, they don't like that. And it does mean that you might be including stuff features that you're not using. So if, you're, if you can individually pick the auto configurations, you might have slightly better startup performance. It depends on your app. It depends on you know, which ones you were using and whether they were needed at startup and that sort of thing. Um, functional bean definitions are also very interesting. I showed you that the red um, blob was significantly faster than the blue blob in the first, first, first slide. The picture's not as clear as that anymore. Um, so I do like functional bean definitions. I'll show you more about them later, but they're not necessarily the only way to improve startup performance, and they, they are a, a signif significant sort of um, programmer burden. Actually, converting all of your configuration to functional is not cheap or easy. Um, and also, in in in, ver in uh, brackets, I've put build a native image. You've probably heard about. Um, Graal VM, they just had a GA release 19.0, right? Graal VM has this neat feature where you can take a Java program and compile it to a binary image like you do with Go, Lang, or Rust or something. And the images that you create are small, they run in quite small memory compared to a big JVM, and they start up quickly. So that, that could be interesting, right? And um, uh, Jürgen mentioned it this morning already. We are definitely going to be doing that with Spring applications, probably with some restrictions, but not too onerous. Um, however, it's work in progress, so that's why it's in, in brackets. I don't think anybody's really ready to go into production with this yet. And the native image feature actually isn't GA yet either. So they released Graal VM and they took that native image feature out at the last minute. So they left it in um, developer preview, they call it. So it's, it's not GA yet. OK, um, so another summary screen. And then basically, you can all either leave or um, you know, go to sleep. I don't think the beer is ready yet, though. So stick around if you want to know more about the details. So um, Spring, Spring was always actually pretty lightweight. But one of the things I did in the demo last year here was I just kind of um, I stripped an application down from Spring Boot, take away some features, take away more, take away more, take away more until it was just Spring. Just Spring starting up with nothing, right? No netty, no business logic, no anything. And it's really fast, right? I mean, like, you can start a Spring application context in, you know, under 10 milliseconds. <laughs> it's nothing. So Spring is pretty lightweight on its own. It's what you do with Spring that, you know, um, is why you, is why you use it. It's, it's why why you want to be that want to be here. Um, but we do care about performance a lot, right? We, this isn't a new thing for me. I've been you know obsessing about this for years. Um, we have made some really truly amazing progress in the last year, but we've always cared about it. Um, there are many optional features. So features are classes that needed to be loaded. So if you don't use them, they won't cost you anything. Um, Exploded war, exploded jar. I mentioned that already. Um, I tried really hard to find a difference between Tomcat, Jetty, and Undertow because I know people have opinions. Um, I think Undertow just about has the has the the, the the prize, but you can't tell much. Like it's marginal, especially with um, Tomcat nine. So the the most recent versions of Tomcat do less on startup than they used to. Um, so there's actually very little difference between the server. Um, containers. Netty is a bit faster on startup, but you know you're talking about 50 milliseconds. You're not talking about, and that's a constant. That's not something that's going to go up or down depending on how many beans you've got. So it's not really that much of a difference. Um, but really, this is it. The more features, the more classes are loaded. 90%, 80-90% of the time on startup is taken with class loading. So that's where you're going to see the difference. Functional bean definitions, I should say, are interesting. Um, I thought I changed that, but maybe I didn't. They are interesting, but they're not going to solve your problem. Um, I did at one point think that they would be the next, the next step, but I'm not so sure. It's nice that they're there. It's good to have an option. We can measure it, but I'm not sure it's actually all that interesting at the end of the day. 
Anyway, um, I can start a Spring Boot application with an HTTP endpoint full stack, JSON rendering everything in less than a second with, yeah, and use less than 10 megabytes of heat. That's really the um, punchline. So the tools that I've been using um, for benchmarks, JMH, it's the only sensible thing to use for JDK benchmarks. It's a micro benchmark framework, but on top of that, um, there's a thing that Mark Paluk from the Spring team wrote, which is JUnit integration um, for JMH. So instead of at test on uh, a test method, you write at benchmark. And that's really cool, right? So it takes your method from a, a test class, essentially, and just turns it into a benchmark. So I've been using that. Um, all the measurements that I show for startup time basically do that and then inside the test method they um, start a new JVM, a new process with a new class path and you know I play around with the class path, I play different games with um, the features in the application by using the Spring Boot auto configuration essentially. For profiling I've used a bunch of things. Async profiler is great, you get those flame graphs. Um, it's a uh, um, and very neat little tool. I've, I'm told there's another one which is very similar called Honest Profiler, I think it's called, but um, this one works for me. Often when I've <coughs> seen those flame graphs I need more detailed information about where the garbage collection pressure is originating and the only tool I found that does anything for that is um, JMC, Java Mission Control, Flight Controller has a a UI which has a specific um, view in it where you can look at um, TLAB, Thread Local Allocation Buffer, and that's the thing that shows up in those flame graphs. It's kind of um, temporary objects that are being churned. They're essentially on, in the stack, but they need to be evicted before the next um, the next round of garbage collection. So you can see that th that stuff happening basically in Flight Controller. Um, I created a little tool, I don't know if anybody's actually used it, but um, you will find a lot of this research in GitHub in various repos. One of them is called Spring Boot Startup, that's in my personal GitHub space. And in there, one of the uh, sub-projects in there is actually an app. So it's a Spring Boot app that you can use to it's not a Spring Boot app, it's a, an, a, it's a Java app that you can use to run another jar file and you know, run it repeatedly, start it up and stop it, start it up and stop it, start it up and stop it, to basically to re reproduce um, a benchmark figure so you can get the time it takes to start up. Um, I have used extensively my thing called a Spring Boot Thin Launcher. I use that to compute class paths fundamentally, <laughs> although it was written origin originally to be a different approach for um, packaging jar files so that they're thin but executable. It also has this um, class path computation feature that I've, I've used to basically change the class path and enable more features for um, benchmarks. And I've also used Aspect J a lot. <coughs> Some numbers, I can flash them up, um, we don't really have time to go into all of the details here, but um, a few things to notice, the demo sample, that's the blue one from the first slide, so it was at the time that I drew that graph on the slide, it was 1300 milliseconds, this one is 900, 935, so that's the, that's the improvements in Spring Boot 2.0. Um, heat memory, 13 megabytes, total memory, that's an estimate, it's a bit hard to estimate, but um, total memory, 76 megabytes. And, you know, 5,000 classes, and that's the thing that basically generates all of that heat on startup, 900 milliseconds is really nearly all the time it takes to load 5,600 classes. So generally speaking, um, as you change, so I've got one with JDBC and one with actuators, as you in increase the number of features, you increase the startup time, you increase the number of classes. Uh, this sequence here says, um, so this is the demo sample, and then I start stripping features out. As I go further down here, more and more features are removed from that application until I get to the point where it's completely functional. And at that point, it's running in 700 
milliseconds. Um, but there's quite a lot of overhead there in terms of you know maintaining the the, the, the application code. I'll show you what that means. This is interesting. So um, you've got um, uh, quite a tight correlation. It's not exactly a straight line. It's more like maybe two straight lines. Quite a tight correlation between number of classes loaded and startup time. And I did this by um, changing the class path, basically. So it's almost the same application, but running over and over and over. Some of the ones at the bottom here are not the same application. They're the ones where I start you know, removing stuff manually and creating functional bean defini definitions and stuff like that. But they're all on the same curve. It's a pretty tight correlation. And anywhere I found that they were deviating, I went and looked at them and found problems <laughs> and fixed them. So you can do that with your apps, right? You could plot it on that and you could see if it, if, if it was down here, you'd be winning. If it was up here, you'd be thinking that well, you could probably find a problem and address it. Um, this one's interesting. That one is uh, Spring Boot application with Hibernate JPA. So Hibernate is winning, all right? Everybody thinks Hibernate is slow. It's not. Compared to the number of classes that you have to load, over 8,000 is actually pretty good. So the Hibernate team, it turns out, are very aware of these garbage collection problems, and they've highly optimized it over the years. So they've done a really good job there. Need to move a bit quicker. Um, Webflux and Netty, it's a little bit faster, like I said. Um, that's the uh, demo application again, this usual canonical sample. So you're down under 800 milliseconds for that. JLog is the same thing, but I did the class path exclusions. So um, JSON and logback are removed, basically, and Hibernate Validator. Hibernate Validator, I forgot about that. Yeah, so um, the pet clinic needed Hibernate Validator. I couldn't take that out. But if you're not using it, take it out, because that is, um, you know, it's a pretty much constant 60, 70 milliseconds. Maybe not that much, maybe 50. It depends on your platform and everything, of course. But, um, so here are the JVM tweaks. I talked about minus no verify and tiered stop at level one. Uh, I'll quickly mention that one. So you see some blogs, especially older ones, about dev random. You don't need to do that anymore, by and large. But I'm putting it up there just to remind you. Um, it used to be a problem with older versions of Tomcat, and it isn't anymore. OpenJ9 is really interesting. So there's a, there's a feature called Class Data Sharing, CDS, that I believe was invented for app servers like WebSphere and web, log web logic, but I'm not sure that's true anymore because somebody told me a different story recently. But anyway, um, CDS, it tries to take some of that class loading overhead and cache it. Um, so that sounds like a good thing, right? Turns out that um, it's been in the Oracle JDK for a long time. I don't know, maybe since uh, Java 7 even, or Java 6, I'm not sure. Um, and it's now uh, available by default in OpenJDK, so you can get your Java 11 version and use CDS. And if you see performance benchmarks from Java 11 J JDK people, they always switch this on because it helps. Uh, but it's a pain. It's really difficult to generate all of the cache data that you need. You've got to go through this long sort of multi-step process to get to the point where you can run it. OpenJ9 is the IBM JVM that they donated to Eclipse. And with that, you just have like these three command line options. Just go faster. <laughs> and it does. It's amazing. It's about, um, it's not dramatic. This, so the red and the blue are um, JDK 8, standard JDK 8, and OpenJ9. It's a bit faster. It's about, um, it's a percentage thing. It's about 10%, maybe 15, if you're lucky. Yeah, so that's, that might be worth having. Um, and then the exploded class path, obviously. Uh, class path exclusions, okay, I've mentioned Jackson, logback, hibernate, <laughs> validator, definitely. Actuators, I'm not so bullish, um, so bearish about anymore. I think you can leave those in, it's probably fine. Um, you might find other things though. So the thing, the thing to look out for is static initializers, things that happen when a class is loaded, <laughs> right? And so these things have all got horrendous static initializers in them. Actually, not the actuators, but um, those are the three things. Um, lazy beans, so um, there are two features in recent versions of Spring Boot. One is spring.data.jpa repositories.bootstrap mode equals lazy. That was actually in Spring Boot 2.1. Um, I did that in the pet clinic. That would be, for the pet clinic where it's three entities, that would probably be um, 
half a second, maybe 700 milliseconds, something like that. So that's worth having. If you have a large number of entities, it goes up proportionally. It's amazing. So I, you know, you can create crazy applications with 400 entities, and they take you know, a minute to start on my laptop and then you put, make the repositories lazy and it goes down to two seconds. Amazing, right? Um, I, some, sometimes people misinter misinterpret this. I, this is just an observation. Sometimes when I've looked at people's real applications and they were slow, I found that they were abusing at post-construct. They were doing expensive stuff and they knew they were doing it. <laughs> they were, you know, reading files and going to databases and blocking in at post construct and that will definitely slow you down when you're starting. And then there's this thing now in Spring Boot 2.2, Spring Main Lazy <coughs> Initialization equals true. I did that in the pet clinic as well. That probably got me another second, I should think. So that was worth having. Um, okay, so now we're at the bottom of the list of things you can do. So one thing you can try, I wrote a blog about this. Um, you can try to, instead of using at enable auto configuration, you can try this other annotation, at import auto configuration, and then you have to list, you have to know which ones to list, that's the hard thing, right? So this is a, just a standard netty HTTP app with error handling, which is sort of my demo app basically, that's the minimum set of stuff you need to run a netty web flux app. Um, pet clinic, it would have another for well, caching, no, a bit, a bit more than that, maybe caching, hibernate, JPA, um, data source, yeah, probably another half a dozen or so. So you've got to curate that yourself, which is kind of a pain. Uh, and I'm trying, to, both I and um, Sebastian Deleuze, who was talking about Kofu this morning, we're both trying to think of nice programming models for <coughs> simplifying that, making that easier to do. So if anybody wants to do manual configuration, it should, I believe, be possible and should be nicer to do than this. But this, is, this works. Um, it used to be a really big thing. Um, and this, it turned out that um, the big difference between the blue and the red in my original slide was mainly this, mainly just the fact that I'd narrowed down the, uh, the configurations. And when you then added also lazy initialization and a bunch of other stuff that I did in Spring Boot 2.2, it wasn't such a big difference. Um, I do have one picture that sort of shows that. So some pet, pet clinic benchmarks. Um, blue is Spring Boot auto configuration, all you can eat. One of them is just the standard. Um, this is pet clinic, by the way. This is not, not the uh, uh, hello world. Standard pet clinic and with actuators. So actuators off, actuators on. Um, with actuators off, I could get down to less than one and a half seconds starting the pet clinic. Um, and then I've got the yellow, which is manual um, bean definitions, but I guess without lazy. So it starts <coughs> in you know, 1.9 seconds or something. And red is functional, so the functional bean definitions got me a little bit in that, but not very much. On this side, there's n almost no difference. The difference between functional bean definitions and non-functional is nothing. So there's, it's, it's really, it's academic, really. Um, and the uh, auto configuration, again, is a little bit faster because of the lazy bean definitions. So functional bean definitions is interesting. Um, definitely interesting because it doesn't use reflection, right? So this is the standard at configuration at bean. We have Spring has to look at these beans, look at these classes, analyze all the methods, look at the annotations, look at the names of everything, all using reflection. And the reflection is fast, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you want to avoid reflection, you can. And we've done that, you know, since Spring 5, we've had this, this model where you can write an application context initializer and you can call on the generic application context, you can call an API, register bean, register bean, register bean. And that's the same code basically as the pre previous slide. So that's the process. And then you can see why it's, it's reflection free. You can also see why it's a little bit painful, right? If you had to convert all of your configuration to that, it's actually, I think, easier to read. <laughs> when it's annotations, I kind of prefer that. So um, we're not ready to you know, push people into functional bean definitions for everything, but it's an interesting option. 
Spring Cloud function has some functional bean definition features. It's really fast and it works really well on constrained environments like AWS Lambda, for instance. Um, or examples, Spring Foo, uh, Spring Cloud function I just mentioned. Um, there's this micro apps set of applications. There are benchmarks in there as well. Um, that's where the funk and bunk come from, if you're interested in the source code. And Spring Foo, of course, definitely worth mention. Um, another thing I looked at was what happens when you constrain the CPUs. So this happens a lot these days because people are running in virtualized environments, they're running in Kubernetes, they're running in containers that have got um, constrained CPUs. And then we had this app from the Riff, Project Riff uh, serverless platform, um, which uh, runs a function and with four CPUs it would start in less than three seconds. But if you went to one CPU, it went up to nearly 17 seconds. That's horrible, right? It's really horrible. Um, but the same exact app or the same features would run in 600 milliseconds with four CPU and 1,000 milliseconds in one CPU. And the difference between the two is um, the original sucky one <laughs> was Tomcat and uh, auto configuration and you know app configuration, all of that. The the one that doesn't suck is Netty. So less, fewer threads, so um, less load on the CPU. Um, Netty, functional bean definitions, but exactly the same features. So it's interesting. Um, there's definitely some mileage there. And that's one of the most dramatic results I've ever seen. Last slide. Um, so ahead of time compilation is coming. GraalVM can generate native images for Java applications, including Spring Boot applications. This is the bunk application I'm showing here. Started in. 40 milliseconds, so that's what you're looking at, right? It's not just a factor of 10, it's a factor of 100 faster than, you know, raw JVM startup time. <coughs> that's the promise, and we, you know, we'll get there. Um, we're pretty close now, I think, with um, a large class of Spring Boot applications. Downside, you lose all sorts of things, debugging, JMX, manageability, <laughs> dynamic compilation, so the um, runtime uh, optimizations are gone. Um, garbage collection, it doesn't happen. So they're simulating all of that stuff, but they're basically, you know, um, they're starting from a long way behind, right? There's a lot of uh, engineering effort has gone into the JVM over the years. You're not going to be able to take advantage of that running this kind of application. Many issues have been solved. So we're working uh, quite closely with the Oracle team. They want Spring Apps to work on GraalVM, we want them to work, so it's still a work in progress, but I think um, Jürgen was predicting Spring 5.3 um, might be a target for this. I think that's probably, that's probably fairly accurate. It'll happen before that, but you know, I don't even think that native images will be in production before that anyway. So that was the end. Uh, a bunch of links there so you can take a picture. I'll, I'll send the slides out anyway. You can... Uh, um, all have a link to all the links <laughs> um, at some point in the future. So I've got to stop there um, because it is time for beer. I can ask answer questions over beer. Does that sound like a reasonable compromise? Thank you.